Welcome today. I'm so excited to be here uh, to this uh, Montreal Summit for Canada 2067. I'll be 102 if I'm still here in 2067. But you'll be there. You'll be there and you'll be shaping the world. And I think it is, this project is so great. Parce que vous allez pouvoir définir ce que va être le futur de l'enseignement des sciences, de la technologie, de l'ingénierie et des maths. On n'enseigne pas aujourd'hui comme on enseignait dans mon temps. And I'm sure that in 2067, we won't learn the same way we're learning today. So you're here to try to shape the future. And, you know, like, I think it's a great opportunity for you guys, but also for us at Let's Talk Science, Parlons Science, de pouvoir avoir le tout ce brain power qui va nous aider à pouvoir agir pour la vie. Because I don't know if you read that, but it seems that 60% of the job that are going to be held by kids that are at primary school today don't even exist. Alors on est en train de finalement vivre une grande évolution et vous allez pouvoir y contribuer. Aujourd'hui, on va rencontrer des gens exceptionnels. People that have career paths that are going to inspire, inspire you, but also <coughs> give you ideas of how to shape the future. Et c'est comme ça qu'on va pouvoir commencer la matinée ensemble. Et euh, ça va être finalement de, de parler euh, avec des personnes qui sont en train de travailler aussi à mettre des petits éléments de l'avenir ensemble. Et avec vous, ben, on va accélérer ce processus-là. They'll speak for about three to six minutes each because we know that, you know, like in the way you learn, we have to be fast and quick getting the message to you. A bit like a video game. So we'll try to be as quick and sharp than those who actually can play video games. So this is you know, like a big challenge for you guys to keep the interest of those young people, making sure that they have fun, they learn, and they can contribute. Parce que à la fin de la période de présentation de nos invités, vous allez aussi pouvoir poser des questions. La présentation va se faire un peu en anglais, un peu en français. Donc, sentez-vous à l'aise dans la langue euh, que vous portez le mieux, que vous pratiquez le mieux et qui vous permet de vous exprimer le mieux. For those who are following with the web or the live stream, you can also have a channel in French and in English. And so that way, you know, like it's easier for you to follow. Même chose pour les gens ici dans la salle. Si jamais euh, vous avez une langue avec laquelle vous êtes la moins familière, il y a un service de traduction que vous pouvez aller chercher euh, des écouteurs et comme ça, dans le, le mettre euh, sur le bon canal et vous assurer que vous ne perdez pas un mot de ce qui se dit euh, aujourd'hui. There is also an app that helps you get all the information about the event. So you have the Event Mobi app. And maybe you have already downloaded, but you have all the information about the speakers and uh, the event of the day. Um, L'autre chose qui est importante, c'est que vous avez reçu pour votre manteau, et ça c'est vraiment de la cuisine, mais c'est important de le faire, un petit carton jaune. Et ce serait bien effrayant qu'à la fin de la journée, plus personne n'ait de petit carton jaune, qu'on parte avec le manteau de quelqu'un d'autre, puis que ça crée entre Val d'Or, Montréal et les communautés autochtones un espèce de grand mélange où on cherche tous nos manteaux à la fin. Uh, in order not to lose this yellow ticket, please put it uh, behind your badge, so that way I'll be with you all day. Because we found some yellow ticket, you know, like a little bit everywhere on the floor, so that's already the, the, the beginning of something, of a great, you know, encounter of people looking for their, uh, their you know, apparel. Donc, j'espère que comme ça, ça va vous simplifier un peu euh, la vie. Alors, pour débuter, j'aimerais vous présenter Elder Kevin Deer. Elder Deer is a ceremonial ritualist at the Mohawk Trail Longhouse, where he helps to perform the ancient ceremonies, speeches, dances of the Longhouse people. He is an elder and a resource person of Iroquois spirituality, philosophy, culture, ceremony. Il est engagé depuis plus de 30 ans dans la philosophie européenne. Welcome, Elder Deer. Merci. Merci. 
Water is the precursor to life. In our creation story, before Sky Woman came to this lower world, water was already here. And those of you that are mothers know that before your little child baby came into the world, your water broke. Water is life, the precursor to life, and then the human being can come into this world. So when we sing our sacred songs, we acknowledge all the waters in this earth that continue to sustain life. And now, to our mothers, our belly buttons, we're connected now to our earth mother. So anyway, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share at this moment in time. I wish I could stay with you all day, but the star constellation Pleiades, and five nights after the new moon into the new after winter solstice, the days we have our midwinter ceremonies, we have seven days of all sacred song and dances for the continuance of life. And I gotta get back because people are relying on me. So I bid you all a great conference and hopefully that put your best collective mind. what comes before us for the rest of the day. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bonnie Schmidt. I'm president of Let's Talk Science. And for about 25 years, Let's Talk Science has been working with uh, students and with educators from coast to coast to coast. And our goal is to help you build skills, to think big, prepare for a future that is increasingly shaped by science and technology. In fact, you may have experience with Let's Talk Science volunteers. We have a few of them around the room today in our Let's Talk Science t-shirts. And our goal is to help you become the innovators, the entrepreneurs, and the citizens that will lead us to 2067, the next 50 years. So today's summit, our Canada 2067 Regional Summit, is partly to inspire you. So the morning is about how can we inspire you, how can we get you thinking really big about the future. And then the afternoon is for you to tell us what you think. We want to hear your ideas, we want you to think big, we want you to be bold, and you want to work with us to help shape the future of science and technology, engineering and math education in Canada. And we'll get back to that a little bit later. I want to welcome Marie back to the stage to kick off our day and lead us on what I think is going to be a great adventure. You might not know her as much as I know her. But I can tell you, she's a real pioneer. C'est quelqu'un qui n'arrête jamais et qui chaque jour pense à vous et à l'avenir et à comment faire en sorte que vous aimiez les sciences, la technologie, l'ingénierie, les maths. Merci beaucoup. Oui, oui, ça Avant de plonger dans le vif du sujet, notre premier orateur aujourd'hui est un ingénieur. Un gestionnaire de projet à l'Agence, est une ingénieure plutôt, à l'Agence spatiale canadienne, Jamie Sevigny. Good morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you, here with you this morning. Um, I'll start off the day with talking a little bit about uh, what I do and how I got there, but I have a very short period of time to do that. So I'll, six minutes. Six minutes. <laughs> so I'll try to be fast. First of all, um, I have a job that I really love doing, and I, I consider myself very fortunate. I work on really cool projects. I work with some pretty amazing people, and we work together to produce some pretty amazing things. We do amazing, amazing things, and it's all thanks to my STEM education. Um, I work as a project management engineer at the Canadian Space Agency, but when I was in high school, I had no idea that Canada had a space agency. In high school, I worked hard at school, um, I studied, but I, I didn't just concentrate on, on grades. I also played sports year-round, I played piano, I was part of the yearbook committee, I was in musicals, I did everything, I liked everything. Needless to say, I couldn't narrow it down to what I wanted to do when I was older. My parents' motto was, try hard at everything. It pays off. But they also said, well, do something you like doing. And if you like STEM, if you like science, technology, uh, 
stick with it because it opens doors. So I did, and in fact, my sisters did it as well. And I have two sisters, one who's now uh, an intensive care nurse and another one who studied metallurgical engineering, and she's now a marketing manager at a big steel company in Canada. So in high school, I, when it was time to choose between arts and sciences, I stuck with the higher maths, I did physics and chemistry, because again, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was older, but apparently this opens doors. I did the same in Seja, and I decided to go in health sciences because well, I wanted to open doors, and I liked maths, and I figured that health sciences would help me to do something that could help people. But during my two years at health sciences, I realized that there were some things I didn't really like about health sciences, but that's okay. I still had many doors open. When I went to university, I did the same thing. I still didn't know what I wanted to be when I was older, but I chose electrical engineering because I liked maths, and because apparently engineering opens up a lot of doors, which it did. I was very fortunate as an engineering student to have a couple of engineering jobs. One of them was a really cool job, getting to play with really big toys. So I was a student engineer at CAE Electronics where I got to design real, not design, take real aircraft system designs and simulate them into a full flight simulator. It's also during engineering that I got to, oh, we went too fast. When I first worked at the Canadian Space Agency, I was hired as a student engineer in the Satellite Operations Group working on RadarSat 1. And it's here where I realized I had a bit more clarity. I knew I wanted a career at the Canadian Space Agency, but I didn't know what I wanted to be again. After university, I worked a bit in private industry at a job that I wasn't particularly fond of, but when a job opening came up at the Canadian Space Agency, I jumped on it and I got the job. And so I was hired to work as a, to develop and deliver training on Canada's robotics, space robotics, on board the International Space Station. So I got to train astronauts, ground personnel, uh, all the specialists on how to safely and efficiently use the robotics on the International Space Station. And in that job, I also got to train some pretty incredible people. Uh, one of them is Chris Hadfield. I got to work with him. I think you might have heard his name before. But I also got to work with Julie Payette, who is now Canada's Governor General. Then after eight years of working in robotics, I decided I wanted to move into more the project management aspect. I wanted to be part of the uh, design and the decisions made at the beginning of space projects. So right now I'm a uh, project management engineer for the RadarSat Constellation mission. The RadarSat Constellation mission is a, it'll, it's a constellation of three Earth observation satellites that's set to launch this year. So if you're interested in knowing more about that, I highly recommend that you connect to CSA's Facebook or Instagram account and you can get live updates. So in my job as a project management engineer, I don't do design engineering, which is often a misconception of what engineers do. I don't work with hardware. But instead, my engineering degree is crucial because I work on very technical projects and I need to understand the technical concepts, the technical systems, the, te the engineering processes. I need to make recommendations on technical items. Uh, I need to solve technical issues. And for that, my engineering degree was absolutely crucial. And the beauty about working uh, on many engineering projects, which again is another misconception with engineering. We often think of hardware, we always think of building things. But we tend to forget about the outcome of your engineering project, and the outcome tends to help people. So I am doing something that helps people. Uh, the images that will be taken from RCM, from the RadarSat Constellation mission, uh, these are optical images, so these will not be the type of images you see from the satellites. But they're gonna be used to help uh, ships navigate through the northern waters, uh, iceberg detection, flood monitoring, disaster recovery, uh, crop monitoring, forest clear cutting, there's, and you name it, there's many, many uses from radar side images. So if I'm to leave you with a few words of wisdom uh, for today, my parents were actually right about something. Effort pays off, so try hard at everything you do. And next is if you like it, if you like STEM, Stick with it because it does open a lot of doors and it will take you places. And then if I could add a few of my own words of wisdom, 
Career uncertainty is okay. You don't need to decide when you're in high school what you're gonna do when you're older, but find something you like doing and stick with it and keep your doors open. Next is to get involved. If you get involved in activities, projects, sports, you learn about yourself, you learn about what you like doing. You also learn about working in teams, which is also important, but maybe you'll learn that you don't like working in teams and that's okay too. But you'll get experience that you don't usually get in the classroom. And finally, be yourself. Don't be afraid to be yourself. Often people think of an engineer to fit in a specific mold. You don't need to fit into that mold. There's many different types of engineers out there doing many different things. And in fact, in teams that are diverse, be yourself. Teams that are diverse will come up with some of the really most impressive outcomes and make some of the best teams. So I'm going to leave you with a final picture of the International Space Station. We get quick too fast, or I'm too fast. And I would like you to think of how many people, how many different people, diverse people it took to build the International Space Station. Thank you. This is great because, it, in fact, you know, like a lot of lesson, lesson learned and a lot of things that you know, like to think about uh, in your career path, in your own career path, and this is. You know, like what this morning is all about, meeting people that will help you find out, think bold, like uh, Buddy mentioned. I like also the idea of being complete, being able to do sport as well as, you know, like studying STEMs. It's, I think it's also important to be able to have diverse interests in your life. Ça va vous aider à comprendre différentes choses dans cette diversité dans laquelle on doit travailler aujourd'hui parce que effectivement nos milieux de travail sont de plus en plus euh, diversifiés avec des gens qui doivent agir en complémentarité pour être capable de bâtir quelque chose d'aussi extraordinaire. Merci beaucoup, Jim. Now I'd like to invite a speaker from one of Canada's 2067 funding partners. Uh, they, uh, they are going to make a few remarks. Please join me in welcoming. Maud Beaulieu, gestionnaire de Vision Oncologie, et Francis Harrison, Senior Manager of Corporate Accounts from Engine Canada. Bonjour à tous, bon matin. J'aimerais me présenter, je suis Francis Harrison, je travaille pour la compagnie Amgen. And let me introduce you, my colleague Maud Beaulieu, also working for Amgen Canada. Comme vous pouvez le voir, la science nous entoure à tous les jours. C'est très scientifique. Oui. Ça concerne la vie de la science. La science est partout. La science nous entoure. Elle fait partie de notre quotidien, de votre quotidien. Et comme vous pouvez le voir, c'est très branché la science. And it's very cool. <laughs> Alors, on devrait tous dire merci à un ou à des scientifiques pour tout ce qui nous entoure, par exemple. Avoir une voiture. Manger sainement. Avoir des soins de qualité. Les estimes sont bien plus qu'un travail traditionnel. On peut devenir un ingénieur, comme on vient de voir. Ou un pharmacien. Pharmacienne. Cela peut nous mener à des carrières passionnantes. On va vous parler un peu de nos carrières. Comme euh, un skatepark. Personnellement, je n'ai jamais fait de skatepark, mais je peux comprendre rapidement qu'en voyant toute la géométrie, les courbes, les sauts qu'on peut utiliser, derrière tout ça, si on le voit d'un angle scientifique, on peut voir sûrement des mathématiques, l'ingénierie, donc, les carrières en sciences peuvent être très, très, très variées. Les scientifiques peuvent aussi se diriger du bon côté de la force. Les hackers peuvent détruire, mais les hackers éthiques peuvent aider à se protéger contre les attaques des hackers et à euh, réparer les dommages causés par les mauvais hackers. Je suis aussi sur ma très au courant des plateformes informatiques et des jeux vidéo. Donc, encore là, il y a beaucoup, beaucoup d'avenir dans cette vidéo. Évidemment, dans le domaine du euh, scientifique, laboratoire, euh, recherche, il y a des carrières euh, qui, qui 
sont, euh, qui nous mènent à, ces, à, ces, à ce genre de travail -là. Et toi, Francis, qu'est-ce qui t'a attiré vers les sciences? Curiosity. Uh, is what led me to science, especially health sciences. Uh, I've always loved and still love science because I always wanted to know things and know how things were explained. Uh, how the human body works fascinates me still today. Uh, at school, my favorite courses were biology, math, physics, and ecology. Ecology, so STEM. What about you, my colleague? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to ask. J'ai toujours aimé comprendre euh, le comment et le pourquoi de tous les processus naturels, que ce soit dans le corps humain, exemple, quand je mange euh, une pomme, que ça, comment, ça se dé, comment ça se digère et de quelle façon ça procure de l'énergie au corps. Aussi les processus naturels, alors pourquoi le, les plantes purifient l'air, on entend toujours ça, mais c'est comment on explique le processus. So Francis, what was your academic path to lead you to your scientific career? Uh, I went to Pure Sciences uh, at CEGEP to uh, become a nurse. Then I continue as a nursing background at the University of Montréal. So another three years of study. And I did nursing uh, as, a, as a nurse for about five years. Then I switched to the pharmaceutical industry with Amgen Canada. It's now it's been 15 years that I've been with Amgen Canada. And we're calling for how many years now, bro? Almost seven. What about your background? Un peu comme toi, j'ai fait mes sciences pures au cégep. Je ne savais pas tellement vers quoi je me dirigeais, mais les sciences pures, je crois que c'est les sciences naturelles que ça s'appelle maintenant. Euh, ça m'ouvrait toutes les possibilités à l'université. Alors, euh, j'ai fait un, ensuite un bac en biochimie et j'ai fait une maîtrise en biologie moléculaire pour commencer dans un laboratoire de recherche. Chez Amgen, maintenant depuis 15 ans, je travaille avec des professionnels de la santé à tous les jours. Je travaille avec des médecins spécialistes au niveau de la néphrologie, donc les reins. Je travaille avec des infirmières spécialisées en néphrologie. Je travaille avec des nutritionnistes. Et je travaille aussi avec des pharmaciens. Donc, c'est très important de travailler avec l'équipe multidisciplinaire, toujours en ayant comme optique le bien des patients. Suite à mon euh, environ un an et demi, deux ans de travail de laboratoire, j'ai réalisé que ce n'était pas exactement ce que je voulais faire. Donc, j'ai euh, trouvé un nouvel emploi comme représentante pharmaceutique chez Janssen. J'ai travaillé pendant dix ans chez Janssen pour ensuite changer de nouveau de compagnie travailler Francis chez Amgen comme représentante pharmaceutique. Concrètement, on rencontre des médecins. Dans mon cas, c'est l'oncologie. Donc, je rencontre des médecins oncologues, des médecins urologues, des médecins radio-oncologues, des infirmières et des pharmaciens, pharmaciennes. On leur parle des nouveaux médicaments en oncologie. On leur explique de quelle façon ils fonctionnent, de quelle façon on doit les prendre. Euh, comment gérer les effets secondaires. On fait aussi beaucoup de formation, euh, autant auprès des infirmières que des médecins que des pharmaciens. Et évidemment, mon background euh, scientifique me donne la crédibilité et m'aide à comprendre tout ce qui euh, explique le processus pour, euh, malheureusement, développer un cancer, mais aussi la façon dont les médicaments fonctionnent pour traiter, parfois guérir les cancers. Donc, Amgen est une entreprise euh, dans le domaine de la science, comme vous pouvez l'avoir. Euh, Amgen vient du mot... Euh, euh, Applied Molecular Genetics. Ah, bien sûr, une compagnie qui existe, euh, qui est mondiale, qui existe depuis environ 35 ans et qui développe les, mo les molécules euh, pour euh, les maladies graves. Amgen dé euh, développe des nou nouveaux médicaments dans le but euh, de transformer la médecine de demain, évidemment dans le but aussi d'aider euh, les patients. On a des laboratoires un peu partout à travers le monde, all around the world. Uh, in Canada, we have in Vancouver, uh, uh, not, not a, a laboratory, not to produce medication, but to develop medication. And we have some of them all around the world, we're about 50 countries around the world. So there's a lot of traveling involved if you're also interested in science and traveling. Donc, les emplois de demain, autant chez Amgen qu'un peu partout dans le monde, 
un nécessite les, les systèmes. On vous encourage donc à poursuivre dans les, à faire les sciences, si vous aimez euh, les sciences, de persévérer, euh, de laisser le plus de portes ouvertes. Donc, euh, on sait rarement ce qu'on veut faire à 15 ans, des fois même à 20 ans, on ne sait pas encore. En, en, en ayant le plus de bagages possible, ça va vous donner, ça va vous ouvrir plus de portes, ça va vous garder plus de possibilités pour en faire différents parcours de carrière. Parce que des fois, on commence un emploi, finalement, c'est pas exactement ça qu'on aime, on ne le savait pas euh, deux ans avant. Et avec un bagage le plus équipé possible, ça nous permet d'aller vers d'autres emplois qui, euh, qui vont nous amener euh, à cette année. So we're inviting you to come and visit us because we would like you to do a little funny test that we both did to, to discover if, if you are an explorateur, a conceptor, a producteur, or an innovator. So come to visit us, Francis and Mo. Thank you very much. That's going to be a great test to, uh, to actually do, uh, to, get, to discover what, what type of person you are. Maybe you are all of them. Uh, you can be you know, like an innovator that likes to you know, build things. So you're going to, that's going to help you maybe find a career path. And as Jim said earlier, you don't need to decide just today. So that's a good thing. But one thing that you know, all our speakers said already is that science uh, actually stands open door. So you'll like pursue this career and uh, this uh, this path, and it's going to help you. You know, like in your life, in your everyday life, because you know something. I actually my path is a bit different than everybody else because I'm not uh, a scientist. Uh, I'm not in STEM, but I like to understand STEM. And when I was in Cégep, I studied technique des matières plastiques. That's something that actually helps you become sometimes uh, you know, like a technician uh, in plastic or maybe pursue your career path in engineering. But you know, after CIGEP, I discovered that that was not my life and I decided to go in communication. But you know something? Every day, the science classes that I took in that, you know, in, in that profile that I, uh, I chose when I was younger is helping, is helping me understand my world. Ça, ça fait en sorte qu'on devient curieux. Hein? Ça, ça nous aide à aller chercher des, euh, des éléments dans notre vie qui font qu'on devient des apprenants pour la vie. Et être curieux, c'est ça. C'est apprendre à apprendre. Se donner de la flexibilité dans nos vies. Puis dire, « Hey, j'aimais ça aujourd'hui, mais j'ai envie de découvrir un autre monde. J'ai tous les outils qu'il me faut pour être capable de faire ça. Parce que j'ai appris à apprendre. À apprendre, j'ai appris à ouvrir mon monde. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit like what we want to do today, uh, today open our world. Et vous savez quoi? En septembre dernier, le gouvernement du Canada s'est donné des outils pour aider notre pays, le pays de, de Canada, pour aider le Canada à ouvrir ses horizons. Et c'est en se dotant d'un conseillère scientifique en chef qu'on a voulu euh, faire ça. Avant d'occuper ce poste-là, notre scientifique en chef, c'est aussi le, rôle, le titre qu'on peut lui donner, elle était vice-rectrice à la recherche de l'Université d'Ottawa, professeure à la faculté de médecine et directrice du laboratoire de génétique moléculaire et régénération cardiaque. C'est pas bien quand même. C'est un privilège, vraiment, de l'avoir avec nous. Je suis certaine qu'elle est très, très, très sollicitée mais elle a choisi d'être avec vous parce que je pense que vous présentez ce qu'elle souhaite que le Canada devienne. Docteur Mona Hemmer. Merci beaucoup, Marie. Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning, everyone. Are we awake? All right. So, as you heard, I'm, I'm a scientist. Actually, I studied chemistry. I hated biology, which is ironic, because I did all the rest of my career in biology, okay? So here's a message for those who love or hate biology or chemistry. Since September, I'm the Chief Science Advisor in Canada. What does that mean? It means I get to advise the Prime Minister, the Minister of Science and Government, on science and science issues. 
and you heard already that science is everywhere in our life. So I really have a cool job. And if you know, if you want to know how cool it is, just check my Twitter account and see how varied it is. But the best part of the job is when I'm with young people like you. Not only you make me feel young, but you are the future of the country. You're the people who will take care of us. So we better be good friends together, okay? I also do research, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about my research. But first, let me ask you a question. When you think of someone who saves lives, what comes to your mind? Firefighter, doctors, surgeons, that's doctors. Anything else? How about scientists? Today, I'm here to talk to you about how scientists can actually help save lives. So you're right, there are many people who can help save lives. And usually we think of medical doctors, and that's true. They save lives one person at a time. They work hard, they save lives one person at a time. Scientists, on the other hand, we keep forgetting this. When they make a fundamental discovery, when they understand how a disease happens or how to cure it, you know what? They save thousands and millions of lives for years and years to come. That's cool, isn't it? Okay, let me give you an example. So, what you see here is actually a young student athlete, fit young person like all of you here, playing football and just dropping on the field. And before you know it, the, the young athletic person dies. Well, that's not supposed to happen, right? We tell people you have to exercise, stay fit, because you know, you get a longer life. What's going on? Well, what's going on, turns out, is the heart of this uh, young uh, person, and the person is born with a small defect in the heart, okay? Tiny defect, so this is the heart, okay? It's here, just like the one you draw when you love someone. And then the heart has four cavities, Blood flows in a very orderly manner, and when you uh, play soccer, and when you're in love, and when you're stressed, the blood just pumps much, much faster. But then what happens, in some people, they're born with like little defects, tiny defects, holes here. So now we have leakage between the different cavities. It could be here, could be there. What happens is, most of the time, we're just fine. But then suddenly, if there is increased stress or pressure, or if there's anything else that stresses the heart, well, we cannot now mount the proper response, and this is what happens. So if we want to avoid this from happening, we need to know who has any small, tiny defect, and we need to prevent any bad things from happening. So let me, before I tell you how we can do this, let me tell you why sometimes we have these small defects. Well, it turns out that there is a tiny change here in, our, in the DNA of one gene. Now, you all know that genes are the biological codes of our cells and our bodies. They're the ones that determine in part if you're blonde, if you have blue eyes, if you're tall, if you're short, but they also determine the shape of your organs. So that is because the genes are going now to basically make cells. You heard of stem cells. These are cells that can be anything. They're you know, very flexible. They can be heart cells. They can be brain cells. If they have the right genes, they will become what they're supposed to become. So here, for example, when we want to make a cardiac cell, we need to have certain genes. And when there is a change, a defect, a mutation in these genes, where the process just doesn't work. So you don't have enough of the cell, and you cannot make a proper organ. How can science help? Well, the more we know about how our organs develop, the more we know about the cause of disease, 
the better we can diagnose it early, right? We can know what's, what's happening before it happens. We can help prevent degeneration or bad accidents uh, from happening. And of course, we can try also to fix it. We can have uh, uh, molecules, drugs that can fix the problem, or we can even edit our genes, or we can make organs or parts of the organs outside our body and then put them in our body, okay? So this is all part of what we call regenerative medicine. Now, who do we need to do all, the, all this work? We need biologists, we need chemists, we need physicists, we need engineers, and of course all this has data and we need computer scientists. So my message to you is simple. If you're curious, if you're adventurous, if you like to work in teams, and if you like to save lives, please become a scientist because the world actually needs scientists and science needs you. Okay? So let's go. Et euh, notre prochaine présentation, vous allez voir, va aussi beaucoup vous intéresser parce qu'on a parlé donc de la santé. Et c'est important de parler de la santé parce que je pense que c'est la base de ce que nous sommes comme humains. Mais c'est aussi important de parler de jouer et de jouer. Donc, notre prochain guest va vous introduire un peu comment ça fonctionne. Son nom est Eli. Ashbush, yeah, I pronounce him well. Founding president at Game Dev, Miguel. So, sometimes I have a bit of difficulty explaining to people what I do as a game developer. Maybe it's because I'm afraid that they think I spend my days doing this. So, you know, I'll boil it down quickly and I'll say, uh, you know, like I make the characters on the screen move around and do stuff. But, to be honest, there's a bit much, there's a bit more that goes into it than that. And I just don't know where to start. Here goes nothing. So I'm a game developer. I'm part of a huge entertainment and tech industry that spawns the world. Uh, we entertain about 2.2 billion players around the world, which is close to 30% of the world's population. I also happen to live in Montreal, which is one of the biggest hubs for game development in the world, with huge studios like Ubisoft, EA, Bethesda, Warner Bros., you name it. Huge games are made here by a lot of my colleagues. And in my day-to-day, -day, I don't just make the little character move around on the screen. No, I bring code to life, turning things like this into this. I get to bridge together a variety of different fields of studies. Things like physics, programming, math, but also other interesting things like literature, art, and music. I get to turn it into worlds that people can experience and explore. And I get to work with a variety of incredibly talented and passionate people People like game designers, other programmers, musicians, artists, writers, you name it. But the best part about my job is that I get to express my creativity in ways that I couldn't have imagined. In ways that someone like me, who was absolutely horrible at arts and crafts in high school, and who can't draw a stick figure to save my life, couldn't have thought possible. I get to turn my code into worlds where anything is possible. Where things like the laws of physics or reality don't really apply. I get to make worlds where robot dinosaurs roam the lands. I can turn back the clock to 300 years before Christ and let you live in the world of the ancient Egyptians. Or, I can send you to an alternate reality where you have to cook in order to save the world from a giant meatball. <laughs> the only limit is my imagination. But, as game developers, we try and do a bit more with games than just entertain. Because games can do more. Games can teach us about history. Give us a glimpse into the minds of people who suffer from mental illness or they can even serve as a meditative experience for some. We try and make games into more than entertainment because they can convey messages, experiences, emotions, anything really. And we try and push these games to be more than entertainment, to be maybe, you know, like art, culture, or even power of good for good, something that can maybe change the world a bit. And that's just a small slice of what game development has to offer because the technology that we use has incredibly wide applications. Things like virtual reality, augmented reality, AI, machine learning, whatever you want. It has applications everywhere and the impact is huge. You could make a virtual reality simulation for surgeons so they can practice before they actually have to operate on someone's heart. 
Or you can make a simulation for natural disasters so you can figure out what could happen to that tiny village when an earthquake hits. Or you could even make an application for students like you or like me so that we can learn through experience and interacting maybe rather than just sitting there and listening to a lecture go on and on. What we can do in game development and by creating experiences is incredibly powerful. And as our technology keeps on advancing more and more, honestly, there is no limit to what we can do. And so yeah, that's, that's what I do as a game developer. But to be honest, with everything that there is possible, I'm much more interested in what you could do. Thanks. much more than what you thought about gaming. I think it's, uh, and it's, it's true. It's true, you learn a lot of things through, uh, through gaming. Um, now, uh, it's time to play a short video from another Canada 2067 partner, founding partner, 3M Canada, that will be followed by a word from Peter Maroulis, Senior Application Development Engineer. When you're never more than 10 feet away from 3M Science, it's in our projects, our homes, our hospitals, our job sites, our cars, just about everywhere. From the smallest objects to the biggest objectives. But to us, it's not just about the products we make. We're a science company, working to improve lives everywhere, every day, and helping to put a bright and sustainable future for all of us within reach, especially for them. Hello. Bonjour tout le monde. Hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Peter Marulis, so I'm very excited to be here with you today. Um, so what do I do? Um, so I'm the application development engineer at 3M, so what does that mean? Um, so I lead uh, new materials, uh, new applications in the aerospace in industry for 3M uh, in Canada and globally around the world as well. Um, so a little bit about, about myself. Um, a little bit, uh, the first speaker also mentioned, in high school I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I loved playing soccer, that was my, uh, that was my thing in, in high school. Um, but I also liked aircrafts. Every, every summer I would go to Greece with my parents and I would always be inspired on, how do these things fly? And I'd like to be part of that in the future. Um, in CGIP I joined uh, Pure and Applied Science, uh, where I really wanted to enhance my um, chemistry, my physics, my mathematics. Uh, I then joined Concordia um, in mechanical engineering um, and uh, Concordia's Institute of Design and Innovation in Aerospace where that allowed me to be uh, an intern um, at Pride & Whitney. This is uh, where I got my first experience in, uh, in aerospace. Um, throughout my time at Pride & Whitney, this is really where I love touching aircraft components. You're not, no longer flying in them. You're actually touching them and you're trying to improve them. And that was my internship at Fred Whitney. Um, I then went to a company called Sonica in, um, in Mirabel, um, where, uh, where I enhanced my materials knowledge. Uh, I didn't like materials in university. I really wanted to study aerodynamics, but I went into a company where material science was very, very important. Uh, so I, I was their materials and process engineer for four years, um, which then allowed me to join a company like 3M, where materials uh, uh, matter. So 3M plays a big part in aerospace. Um, many of our materials, like composite resins, adhesives, sealants, thermal acoustic insulation, are part of the build of an aircraft and of spacecrafts. Um, as an engineer in aerospace, I've always been interested on in how materials are made, and what they could do. But what I love the most is how to learn how to make them useful for the aircraft. Um, something that impacts people's lives for the better. It is very exciting to try new ideas and to be part of new innovations. 
That's why I love working at 3M. Every day, our team uses science to find some uh, solutions to our country's uh, challenges. This could mean creating materials that are lighter to help reduce weight on the aircraft and increase its fuel efficiency while maintaining great performance. Materials that could be more environmental friendly, reducing the waste and making our planet safer and also safer for the operators that actually build the aircraft. Everything we do is about contributing to greater sustainability, helping our customers succeed, and putting a brighter future within reach. We are only able to do this by working as a team. Together, everyone achieves more. I've actually brought two of my colleagues here today um, from the lab, James and uh, Stephanie. Please say hello. We do, our, we do our best work when we share knowledge and ideas and learn from one another, get inspired from one another to find better, smarter solutions and faster. That's what we feel so strongly about the role of STEM education will play in meeting the challenges of tomorrow. We need to continue to fill our lab with people who can think critically, make decisions and be problem solvers. People who are curious, who think outside of the box and want to discover. That's a STEM education. So just a show of hands, who, who here gets asked, what do you want to do when, you're, uh, when you grow up? <laughs> there you go, well, I was one of them. Um, so what do, you, what do you say to that, a couple of uh, answers? Sure. Okay. So, so here, here, here's a question for you. Do you want to be involved in things that matter? What do you like to do? What do you like in your life right now? What do you want to target it? So, so, protect, so like protecting the environment, developing the latest technology to disrupt an industry, or changing the world. Personal computers came, what, 40 years ago. Uh, smartphones came about a decade ago. Technology is advancing. Uh, truth is, it's advancing every day, every second, pretty much. Uh, we want to make sure that we are part of this development and not simply follow it. It is time to, uh, to look ahead. And that is why we are passionate about supporting STEM education and proud to be a founding partner of Canada 2067. On behalf of 3M Canada, I want to thank you for your time. And it's true, it all starts with a passion. The prochain invité, peut-être qu'il parlera de sa passion, c'est une biologiste marine. Elle est originaire du Québec, elle travaille maintenant au collège da, uh, College of the Atlantic, dans l'état du Maine. Rosemary Seaton. changed gears uh, quite a bit. We've gone from aerospace and uh, video games, and now we're going to go for a deep dive into the ocean. Uh, how many people have been to the ocean? Yeah, all right. Uh, probably a lot of you have gone down to Maine. That's where I work, down at College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor. And being a marine mammologist, I work with whales, dolphins, porpoises. And so I'm going to tell you, because you know we have to know what our path was to get where we're going, um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what I do. Okay, these are some of the critters I work with, so you can go, ah, they're cute. <laughs> Especially these little guys right here. Is this, um, yeah, these are harbor seal pups. This is a harbor seal, comes down from Canada, yay. Uh, the main uh, gray seal pups that are being born right now. Harbor porpoise, humpback whales, I've worked with humpbacks a lot over the years. So um, those are some of the prime suspects, and I'll get to those in a sec. This is my office. It's not too shabby. <laughs> That's me out in a boat. Really good, you know, we talk about different skills to have. Boat handling skills, navigation, oceanography, all those things. There's STEM stuff that comes into even running a boat. 
And this is my office at College of the Atlantic. It's my building. It's a really awful view looking over the bay. Uh, and this is the office. And no, that's not a funny looking seal. That's uh, my friend's dog who came in the office. All right. Me as a kid. Yes, I was a kid. And that's me in a tidal pool that's Higgins Beach uh, down in South Portland, Maine. Uh, and uh, with my, one of my older brothers hanging out in tidal pools. I was fascinated by the ocean. Just amazing. I think what got me with the tides, tides would come in and tides would go out. And I thought that was magical. And I, that's still magical to me to this day. I also loved combing the beach for uh, shells. And to me, they were like little treasures that you found on the beach. Now I find seals on the beach. All right, so that's me as a kid in Montreal. Yes, Montreal born and raised here with my cat as a teenager. And so I went from that. So how does a Montreal girl go from uh, uh, being with my kitty and, and the machine where I grew up to uh, hanging around with seals? Yeah, uh, guys. So, um, well, you might say I jumped on a ship and went out to sea. And, and well, I'm only kidding. I, I did that later on in life. But what was fascinating was uh, my seminal point, or moment, I guess, was in Sejep. And I did a course, and I was doing STEM courses like chemistry and math. And by the way, I did terribly. And you, you know, you make mistakes. Don't ever be afraid to fail. You'll come. Just keep, get back on that horse, dive back in, try it again. And that's what I've done. So I went to Sejep, and of course I did. Because you have to do humanities courses. It's core courses. And it was called Animals and Men. It was basically uh, wildlife, human interactions, and we studied whales. I've never studied whales. To me, whales all live way in the deep ocean, not really close to where I live. But we studied whales, and we had someone come, it was the director of the Montreal Zoological Society. He came in and he showed a film. And there was no YouTube, this is 1974. There was no whale watching. And he came in and he showed a film about blue whales. And where were they? Whoops, let me go back one. Oh, I just killed it. <laughs> See, I told you I flunked everything. How do I get that back? How do I go back? Oh, maybe it's that one. There you go. Too many buttons on here. Okay, so here we are in Montreal. They said there are whales right here. I'm like, are you kidding me? We have whales on our doorstep. Right there. And really, not a lot of people knew there were whales there. But there are. And of course, everything leads out into the ocean. And look at it. The ocean is 70% of this planet. And I'm going to make a plug for the ocean right now. If you're really fascinated with scuba diving or running boats or going out to see these animals, go out on the ocean. It's 70% of the planet. And two things to take away from that um, the currents, the those massive currents within the ocean, they're the driving force for climate and temperature. The other thing is plankton. These are the, the tiny little critters in the ocean, the, the phytoplankton. That's plant plankton. It's kind of like the grass of the ocean. Well, they make up uh, our, a lot of our oxygen. In fact, scientists estimate 50, at least half our oxygen, but even eight, perhaps as much as 85% of the oxygen that is produced on this planet is from tiny microscopic phytoplankton. So you don't need to study whales or work with uh, seals. Study plankton, I have a lot of friends who do. It's critically important. So don't neglect the oceans. We have to be better stewards of the oceans. And an elder, our Mohawk elder, saying, uh, we don't give it enough thought, and it's easy not to. You know, we live in inland, but we are connected to the oceans. All right, so what do I do? Yeah, that's better. Um, I worked with humpback whales. Um, I went to Sejep. I did that course. Uh, I went to McGill. Actually, I studied music for a bit. Don't forget doing music. And in fact, really, Stan should have another M on the end for music because you, you need to know fractions to, to study music, right? Uh, and I'm sure plenty of you in this audience play a musical instrument. So I, I studied music, and then I came back to Montreal. I was all over the place in Canada, which was great. Got to see my country. And then I went to McGill, and I actually studied psychology. Because I was fascinated with behavior. And I ultimately ended up in animal behavior. So I went to McGill, graduated from McGill, loved it there. I worked for a couple of years. And um, uh, afterwards, um, I applied to graduate school. And the place I wanted to go, 
There was only one place I wanted to go, and that was Memorial University of Newfoundland. There was a man there, his name was Dr. John Lian, and he was in a program called Biopsychology, and he was known as the whale man in Newfoundland, because he disentangled whales to get whales out of fishing gear. And I saw an interview on CBC, I read about him, and I thought, I want to work with that man, I, I can do a graduate degree, so I could combine my interest in whales, which I always thought that would just be a hobby, but I could combine my interest with whales, uh, bring in some science, and I could work with these animals out in Newfoundland. I'm probably throwing a little music on the side as well. So humpback whales um, at uh, College of the Atlantic, we pioneered and developed a photo identification of humpback whales, looking at the other side of the tail. It's very handy that humpbacks, when they dive, tend to lift the tail when they go on a dive. Not all whale species do that. And also, they have to have these unique markings. Well, we have no program, computer program, that does the matching for us, despite you know, CIS TV shows and whatever that always show everyone matching everything in seconds. It doesn't happen the same way for humpback whales. For years, and I say decades, we have been matching manually, and that's pretty tough. It's laborious and so on. Uh, we try and made it a little bit easier by creating these types and also subtypes. And now we do use computer assisted software. And, uh, and just as a, an example of a match, uh, this was in 2015 in uh, Guadeloupe in the West Indies, and one up to Scotland just taken last year, and that was the first match of its kind. So you get the idea, it's, it's large movements that uh, we look at. Uh, surveys, I'm going to grind through this, I know I don't have much time. Uh, I, I do work, see, I'm on a, this is the ship I worked on. Uh, we work uh, inflatables and uh, doing photo ID. We do acoustic work. If you're interested in physics, you can fold that into doing green uh, mammal research. Uh, genetics, uh, we will get a snag, a little bit of uh, tissue from a whale, and uh, we can do genetic work and a lot of other analyses as well. Uh, that's in the evening. You have long days in the water. You have long days in the office or in the ship's uh, computer lab as well, downloading all the data. So just quickly, Green Mountain Strandings, that's what I do. I look after uh, the northern half of Maine. I respond to uh, marine mammals. We work a lot with seal pups. Uh, uh, Dolph, uh, this is a harbor porpoise that I rescued. It was almost up in Canadian waters near New Brunswick. And I uh, rescued that. Um, so you, you need to do a little veterinary care as well. And I work with veterinarians. And so I've, I've learned and used my math as well to help. I have to calculate how many fluids I need to give to that animal and so on, so it definitely comes into play. So you really are, you feel like you are a steward um, in looking after these animals, and it has a trickle-down effect because we're trained to identify if something is amiss. If, if we have a lot of sick harbor seal pups, for example, or in this case, uh, a few years ago, uh, two years ago, we started to have humpbacks dying off, and now we have what's called an unusual mortality event for humpback whales, and they have heard about all the right whales that died in the Gulf of St. Lawrence this past summer. So we're on the front lines to identify if there's a crisis, maybe there's something amiss in the ocean, maybe there's paralytic shellfish poisoning, hey, that can affect us too, so we're really on the front lines. And I'll just skip through some of this and just say thanks very much. If you have questions, I'd like to go to the uh, This is great. It's like people you can start with a passion. You can start by inspiration too, because as uh, Rosemary explained to us, you know, like it's actually someone who, make, uh, who made a difference in her career. And she gets to work in Bar Harbor, which is you know, like it's the the most one of the most beautiful places in Maine, and I would say you know, like uh, yeah, not bad, not bad. Eh? So you can also great uh, have great challenges and uh, work in nice places with nice people. So that's you know, like the best the best of everything. Thank you so much, Rosemary. And you can ask questions as I mentioned at the end. You'll be able to ask questions to all those people who actually presented their back. Our next speaker is Caesar Correa. He's Principal Advisor of Data Science at the Tinto. César. Good morning, everyone. My name is César. I'm Peruvian. I'm, I'm here to, today to talk about data science uh, and why it will power the future. Bon. Je, je prépare ma présentation en anglais 
me abandoné que my English is a little bit rusty. Debe uh, utilizarme no, no, impatient. Okay. If you like mathematics, statistics, computer science, and uh, you feel very curious about uh, how you can use data to solve real world problems, uh, I think this presentation is for you. For example, do you know you can keep track of what people are saying about you on a social network in real time? Likewise, if you want to track people's feelings about you or your company, you can do it. Did you know we can use public data to detect crime patterns? Yes. Thanks to machine learning techniques, uh, it's possible to identify hotspots in town. This allows to immediately deploy police resources to prevent crime or to make quality arrests. Do you know you can use data from smartphones to diagnose mental health conditions and, so, and also some chronic conditions like heart disease? Well, all these applications are possible thanks to data science. But in order to understand the importance and the meaning, the real meaning of data science, uh, we need to be aware of what's happening in our world right now. Thanks to the latest technolo technological developments, now we have lower storage costs, faster computers, and there are more than 15 billion interconnected devices within an extremely large and growing network that we call Internet of Things. Uh, these objects are collecting and sharing data continuously. Um, uh, well, but what about the data we generate in social networks? For example, every minute, every single minute, users upload 72 hours of new video on YouTube. And Amazon makes more than $80,000 in online sales. But, okay, but how we can manage all this data? And the answer is big data. What is it? Uh, big data is a, an integrated strategy to manage data, considering the new challenge this data implies. Uh, new challenge like uh, we, we deal with enormous amount of data that we need to collect and analyze in real time. Uh, this data comes from several sources in different formats and structures, uh, like uh, files, text files, images, video, sound files, and numerical data in tables and rows and columns. And we need to assure its reliability and accuracy. Done. The next question will be, what do we do with all this data? How can we leverage data to improve our lives? And the answer is data science, because it's exactly the mission of data science. What is data science? It's an interdisciplinary field. It's an intersection of several scientific and technological specialties aiming to extract useful knowledge from data. In other words, it's a, data science is a way to, to transform data into insights to solve real-world problems. Some applications of data science are self-driving cars, developed by Google, Tesla, and some other car manufacturers, image recognition, yes, we are capable of teaching machines how to recognize objects, persons, faces, and even how to identify emotions from images. Artificial intelligence personal assistants like Siri, Cortana, Google, uh, that are capable to understand natural language and perform actions. Uh, who can apply all this knowledge? The data scientist can. The profile of a data scientist is uh, a rare combination of skills in, in mathematics, statistics, uh, computer science, programming, data visualization, uh, databases, and domain knowledge. A data, science, a data scientist has an analytical mindset. He's, uh, he's capable to love, 
is capable and loves to solve complex problems and has the ability to communicate results in a simple and comprehensive way. In short, data scientists leverage their different skills to make discoveries in data, to support decision making in order to face real life and business challenges. In 2012, an article in the Harvard Business Review named Data Scientist, the sexiest job of the first of the 21st century. Who doesn't want to be sexy? The estimated shortage of data scientists by 2018 for Canada is uh, about 19,000 data scientists. And for the US, the shortage will be of 190,000 data scientists. And well, for those of, uh, of you who are considering to become data scientists, it will be, a, it will be good to know that uh, Montreal is considered a world leader in artificial intelligence with a very large community including Google, Facebook, Microsoft, uh, Université de Montréal, the, uh, the software company uh, Okay, and what about Rio Tinto, the company I work for? Well, Rio Tinto is the largest mining company in Canada. As a global group, Rio Tinto has operations in several countries all over the world supplying the metals and minerals essential to human progress. Uh, metals and minerals like aluminum, copper, diamonds, gold, iron ore, gold, titanium, uranium, and, uh, and other industrial minerals that we can find in smartphones, uh, planes, cars, hospitals, and of course, uh, to our homes. And to be more precise, I work at the Arvida Research uh, and Development Center, which uh, has a mission to support the strategy of Rio Tinto Aluminium by delivering innovative technology solutions uh, to business. And this center work was created in 1946, and today it has uh, some home employees. Uh, 75% among them are scientists with a STEAM master degree or PhD. With no doubt, this center exists because Rio Tinto understands the importance of innovation, but most of all, Rio Tinto recognizes the significant impact of STEM professionals in our society. Thank you very much for your attention. Big data. So, uh, et uh, ce qui est important aussi de se rappeler, c'est que c'est l'interconnexion de plusieurs secteurs d'activité. Donc, c'est pour ça que ça prend des esprits ouverts pour être capable de répondre aux nouveaux défis euh, de Big Data. Ça fait un moment, et je vous trouve tellement sage, « well behaved » as, you know, like, « well behaved can be the definition ». But, you know, like now, we feel that you need to move a little bit. So here's Michelle Elliott, the Experience Group. C'est le temps de le mettre au défi. Merci. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. You've been sitting for a while. I think it's time to actually get ourselves up and moving. I have the pleasure to be with you uh, today for a couple of movement breaks. And if you're at home live streaming, you can also jump up and join in on the movement break action as well. So can everybody please stand for me? Yay, shake it out. And reach your arms up to the sky. And can you turn to the person beside you, make it a friend if you don't know her behind you. Introduce yourself to three people. Give some high fives. Something, high five. Nice. All right. Okay, folks, we are going to play. Um, uh, we're going to make rock, paper, scissors come to life. So on the count of three, we're going to all do three jumps together. So jump, jump, jump. Ready? Here we go. Jump. Jump, jump, let's try it again, ready, go. Jump, jump, jump. All right, so if you choose to be scissors, you're gonna jump wide, everyone show me scissors. White scissors, yeah. If you're going to be paper, you're gonna be straight up in a row, show me paper, yes. And if you're gonna be a rock, you're gonna go down low in a ball, show me the rock, yes. All right, everybody show me, we'll do three jumps and then let's all be scissors, ready, go. Jump, jump, jump. Scissor, beautiful. One more time, let's all be rock. Three jumps, here we go. Jump, 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 be a rock. Rock. And last one, you got number two low. 
One more time, here we go. Jump, jump, show me paper, go. Paper, all right. You're gonna turn to the person beside you and I want you to play rock, paper, scissors with your body. Now listen, whoever is the winner, whoever is the winner is going to move on and find a new person. If you are the unsuccessful winner, you're gonna join with them and cheer them on as for well the next person. Okay, so play for a couple. So, uh, 
So I, I've been lucky enough, so I started my PhD in 2008 at University of New Brunswick, and then I did a postdoc and was a research scientist at MIT for four years, and I've worked on some really cool stuff. So I'm just gonna give you like a really quick rundown of some of the coolest stuff I've worked on. So related to the oceans, I actually, my background is as a marine roboticist, and my PhD was about deploying robots either on the surface of water or they could swim underwater, they could use sonar to uh, detect mines or also interact with the marine, uh, marine ecology. And this is a super hard problem because uh, deploying robots underwater is very, very difficult. Uh, I also, at, uh, at, at MIT, I worked on a self-driving car project where if you know uh, about, about the Google uh, self-driving car, for example, it needs to have very, very accurate maps of the world in order to work. And so we're trying to, that doesn't scale particularly well in terms of the size of the operational area, but also the things in the world change, and so you have to keep remapping the world over and over. And so we tried to build some algorithms that would work without these prior maps. And then, uh, also starting at MIT, but also uh, continuing on now, we built this, uh, this small-scale self-driving car project that we call Ducky Town. So it's a really an autonomous Uber service for the, for the citizens of Ducky Town, which are the ducks. <laughs> and so we use this to teach a class, but also to do actually cutting-edge research in, uh, in self-driving vehicles. Okay, so I think, I think it's clear at this point that AI and robotics will transform the world in the next 50 years. And so I'd just like to highlight three of what I think are the very, very biggest questions that I think that you guys should be thinking about, about how it's going to transform the world. So the first one is technological. It's kind of the most obvious. Like, as I showed, the robots are all falling over. Like, we don't have a lot of robots in this room. Like, where are they? Like, they, they were supposed to be here by now, weren't they? Like, all we have is, like, crappy vacuums that don't even do a very good job. So where we are right now is we're at the peak of inflated expectations. And in order to get through the trough of disillusionment, we need very, very motivated people who understand the real challenges of deploying these systems in the real world. So I think a lot of people will, will gravitate towards this. But there are two other kind of areas that I think are very important. The first, I think people have touched upon a little bit here, but it's actually social. So as, as, as some people have mentioned, like, the landscape of the kind of jobs that you're going to be able to do in the next 50 years is going to transform dramatically. But at a societal level, if we can kind of automate the boring parts of society, then life should get better for all of us. But it's actually not that obvious how to make that happen. So, uh, you know, right now there's a lot of fear around AI and automation because people are worried that they're going to lose their jobs. But if we step back a second and think on a societal level, this should be a good thing, but how do we make it be a good thing for everybody? So that's one really important sort of social aspect. And then the third one that I think is going to be... It's been less than a week since the deadliest mass shooting in American history. And foremost in all of our minds has been the loss and the grief felt by the people of Orlando. So does anyone think there's something funny about that video? Well, so they want to sing because the sound's not sync, but anything else? Okay, okay, so, so actually that never happened. That was completely manufactured video that never actually happened in reality. So, uh, you know, data scientists took a whole bunch of videos of Barack Obama and generated a brand new video of Barack Obama saying things that he's never actually said in reality. And so this is a danger, potentially dangerous thing. So I really think that we all need to think about how to use this technology for good. Uh, okay, so I think we can all agree though that there's really serious uh, uh, potential for this technology. This is a, a partially blind, a uh, person going for his first drive in a car, in this case, it's a, this is one of the first promo videos that Google put out. And so we really have the ability to transform the world with this technology in a very positive way. And so if you want to get started right now, you can go to duckytown.org and you can buy all the pieces for the robot. It costs about 150 bucks. Ask your mom maybe or whatever. And, then, uh, and you can become part of this global movement. We're trying to build all these cars. And a lot of uh, people your age or even younger have already built these cars and are developing them across the world. So thank you so much for your time. So Christmas is behind us, but there's one coming. So that's really good for that. And you have birthdays and maybe some allowance money that you can use to actually buy this uh, Ducky Town car. So that's uh, all, uh, all, all opportunity. And it's all about saving to get what you want. So that's another good thing, you know, like you'll learn how to save to get what you want and you'll get uh, to be in robotic. So thank you so much. And 
you know, as Caesar, I think, mentioned, uh, intelligence, uh, artificial, artificial, je peux dire en français, l'intelligence artificielle, ça se passe à Montréal, ça se passe ici au Québec, donc il y a des opportunités vraiment extraordinaires. Alors, on va voir où ça nous mène. Our uh, final speaker is Arlumina, the Director of Research and Innovation at Macrocte. A vous l'honneur, Arnaud. It's going to be a challenge because my presentation is a bit a mix of all your presentations. Okay, so... Um, Mid-80s. Mid-80s. Uh, I, I dream to be Michael Knight. I mean, the hero of this movie series, a very famous one. He was very cool, he was winning every time, but more than everything, he was driving this car. And this car was basically a massive technology piece of technology with wheels. And he was able to talk to it, it was answering, he was equipped with a camera, watching out if Mike, Michael was in trouble and turned into automatic driving mode and go and save him. And for me it was science fiction, so I could dream about that. And for you it's a little bit 2015. Right, you can talk to your phone, it goes answer, and the first autonomous driving vehicles are on the road. So basically, Michael was not driving a science fiction stuff, he was driving the future. Because many of the guys working since in the STEM and studying it made or made this dream a reality. Right? Okay, so this was when I was young, I dream about that. And um, 10 years after, uh, I was a young uh, student in applied mathematics in France, in uh, engineering. And I had my first contact with image processing. So the very first time I saw an image and I could apply my mathematics on it. And then I talked about satellites. So I was uh, working for the French Space Agency. And I had a little contribution to this project where we were taking images of the space at a specific location looking at satellites. And this is the kind of image I was working with. It's not very nice. Um, and on this image, you see two spots. And those two spots here are actually satellites located at 36,000 kilometers from here. And there are basically those specific satellites turned with the gas at the same scale. So the lines you see here are actually stars. And the purpose of my project was to detect those subjects um, in the image. Okay? Um, all the point is, just by looking at the image and detecting the position of the stars and the satellites, we can recognize the, the stars, and after that we can locate the satellites without any communication with and actually very accurately. And this spot is 36,000 kilometers away, and we are able to locate this trajectory to plus minus 100 meters. Okay. So, uh, I felt in love with image processing when I did that. So I decided to not work, of course, and I decided to go back to study in this area. And this is what I'm doing since. Okay. So uh, the science of imaging, what it is. At that time when I did it, it was not science fiction, but it was really high tech. And today, you have it in your pocket. I saw you just before all your studies and phones. It's an optics, the sensor, wiring, going, transmitting the data to the CPU, the processor, with algorithms to stop magic with the image. Um, you have to display it on the screen. It's a lot of science behind that. And eventually, at the end of the day, once the algorithm has looked, has looked at the image, taking some decisions and some robots. Right? So we talk about robots. We talk about image processing to automatically match the wave. There's a lot and a lot more camera and images in our industries in general and in our life. There's a lot you can do with. It can be dangerous, but it can be really helpful at the same time. So my job is actually to I work for the algorithms. Okay, my background is an applied mathematician, and I basically create with my teams uh, algorithms to what to measure objects, to find, to locate, to read, to get information from an image automatically. And this is going to be information sent to robots, to machines, to, to the web, eventually. Okay? So we're not going details into it because I have two remaining minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to switch more on uh, something which we can see as the state of the art of putting together all the technologies you're aware of. So you go on hiking and you get lost. Uh, how do we do today to find you? Well, we, we find you by sending you virtually a helicopter and people trying to watch out you, shouting your name. 
but the best we can do eventually it's not artificial. But if we put together all the technology we have today, artificial intelligence, imaging, drones, communication, real time analysis, well, you can imagine a truck with an army of drones sent um, taking pictures um, with artificial intelligence trying to locate not only you, but possibly some okay, uh, for your plants, or some objects you let. So, and you can even add more intelligence to automatically understand, okay, your journey was going there and to concentrate the search at smart locations. This does not exist, but this is tomorrow. People are working on that. Okay, so you see an example where we can integrate all those new technologies you know about to create some cool stuff to, um, to, to risk your people, to save life, as I say. Another example, right? Um, Okay, 2067, in 50 years. I said, Michael Mack was actually not really writing the science fiction, but the future, I didn't knew that a few years ago, right? Uh, even more, let's look at 50 years ago. Do you know this masterpiece? Yeah. Space Odyssey? 50 years ago, the guy was having, in this movie, at the PC. Uh, 50 years ago, a computer looks like that. Okay, so uh, if, you, if you have to, 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 to think about the future, you can look at the technology the way it is today, but I think you have a lot of answers in your own science fiction and art and movies you are aware about, the same way I was a few years ago, dreaming about driving this car. So what is your science fiction? And it gives you already the answers, a lot of answers about the future, more than I do. You have much more the idea of the future than we have. So I repeat you again. But maybe this is <laughs> your source of inspiration and maybe many other sources of inspiration that I'm not even aware of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's what we say, eh? Great minds think alike. And I like this idea that fiction actually and reality can come together and make us think out of the box. Um, before we move to take a question, because it's going to be the interactive part of the activity that's coming in a, in a really, really, really short while, just give me the time to thank all those people who make this happen today. Um, so I want to do a big shout out to the organization that made it possible. And I, thought, I spoke to you about Let's Talk Science, Parlons Science. I think the team deserves a great end. Thank you so much. La Famille Trotti, la Fondation de la Famille Trotti, Hill Holton Strategies, and 3M Canada. National sponsors include the Government of Canada in Ontario, Nelson Education, Samsung Canada, Toyota Canada Foundation. Merci aussi aux partenaires de Montréal, Rio Tinto, AstraZeneca Canada, et Best Buy Canada. Merci aussi à notre hôte d'aujourd'hui, le Palais des Congrès de Laval, le Palace. Merci à l'Institut Without Boundaries, le Collège George Brown et à Grunch, uh, Groundwell Project pour la création des ateliers de cet après-midi que vous allez vivre tous ensemble. Et finally, thank you to Sir Wilfred Barbieu English School Board, Golden Valley in Val d'Or, and Ratiente, I hope I pronounce it well, high school, getting all you here because this is what makes the difference. Merci beaucoup pour tout. de voir ce qui vous a allumé dans leur présentation, what actually puzzled you in, your, in their presentation. They're here for you to actually answer uh, your question. I can start if you want me to break the ice, but if there's someone who actually has the courage to go in front, just go. So I'll start. They're thinking about it. That's very good. Thank you so much to be here. Uh, it makes a great difference to actually have role models and people who actually talk about their path, their industry, the future. So I think we ignite a lot of ideas today and those young people are going to be inspired for sure. Um, let me start by my first question. You've talked a lot about your different profile, how you decided to, uh, to uh, embrace STEM, STEM and uh, you know, what difference it made in your life. But what do you think the biggest challenge is for, you know, like to make sure that STEM is in the life of those young people? 
Who wants to go first? Maybe who? Well, I can, I can start. Uh, I think that we need to change actually the way we teach science uh, because I think that uh, science is a lot more exciting than the way we teach it. And uh, I would say that uh, I, I heard someone earlier uh, say there are too many choices. We don't know what to do. I think we're, we're giving um, our, our uh, great youth uh, uh, the choice to drop out of science mm -hmm. early on, and that's really uh, too bad. And I think that we're also not helping in putting in front of them the different the, uh, field and, and job that uh, STEM education uh, opens up. You don't have to be in a lab wearing a, a lab coat. You don't have to be a nerd behind a, a computer. It's actually, you know, the sky's the limit, your imagination. So I think we need to get over the Concept. Uh, experiential learning is so important. Uh, I know with our students at the College of the Atlantic, uh, they learn so much about anatomy and physiology of seals, for example, or a whale. We get them dissecting them, and I won't go into particulars, but you learn so much about how they look inside and all the different organs and what they do. So experiential learning, I know for me, because believe me, you never stop learning, um, I learned so much about seal anatomy and physiology from doing, and that's the way I work best. So. Is there some question for you guys? I'm sure you have. We, the, uh, maybe you can stand up, speak loudly, and introduce yourself. Oh, we have a mic. That's even better. Uh, no, that's okay. It's the same thing as we're just chatting together. There's no one in the room. Uh, so my name is Anthony, and uh, I want to ask you guys for your opinion about this. Monsanto. Monsanto. So, Tiki, you're, you're wondering about science not doing necessarily what you think is the best. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I think. Do you, you want to go? Um, I, mean, I think that there's this, you know, uh, a, real, a real necessity to have uh, people who understand STEM issues not only developing technology but also in other facets of society like regulatory and, and such. So I think that it's, you know, the path uh, that starts with STEM doesn't always end up, as, as, as we've just discussed, uh, in, uh, you know, what, what you think of as a typical uh, uh, STEM job, but it's really important to have uh, this kind of, this kind of uh, knowledge at, at, at all different parts of society and so I mean for, from a regulatory standpoint uh, we need people who are also making making decisions for us as a society who understand the complexity of these issues. I think it's very interesting because it comes with ethics uh, regulatory uh, environment and it means that as a citizen we choose also governments that are going to make those boundaries and we have to decide what kind of model we want. So it's a part of you know like being aware of what's happening in our world. So it means that science is not the end of everything, but we have as human to make our own boundaries. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Is there other question? Or is the, the someone wants to react to that? Yeah. No, that's okay. Uh, yes. We'll just wait for the mic. It's coming. If you're too shy, you can also use the app. Somebody is going to relate. Uh, to, you know, like to send me the question on, the, on my cell phone here. So if you feel that you're not comfortable with the mic, don't hesitate. You can send questions through uh, the, uh, the app, okay? You can introduce yourself and ask the question. My name is uh, Benjamin, and you're a person who did what we were talking about, robotics and AI, things like that. And I've been treaty signed by great minds like Hawking and Elon Musk talking about and not letting artificial intelligence gain near human intelligence where it is described as the singularity or the end of humanity. How long do some of you think it'll take until this will happen? Ooh. And what will be the We need happen? your crystal ball here. You know, you feel that you know, like uh, in you know, like the uh, intelligence artificial is going to actually take over human intelligence. 
That's, and that can be a little bit scary for myself. Who wants to, uh, who wants to go? Uh, no. Now, you guys, you guys just go. Uh, I don't have the answer, but um, uh, uh, so that the fact is, uh, uh, I like that, that the, the fact that a lot of scientists keep saying, oh, we are very far from, uh, which is true, but we, we progress in this direction. So eventually, um, how much time is maybe not as important as it will eventually happen, right? And it goes back to the previous question about regulation and hitting the limits and what we're going to do with it. So the, 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 how much time, I don't have the answer, but we progress in this direction. So the importance to have a very broad and large culture also as well to understand what's happening in society with those challenges. As a scientist in chief, I guess it's something that you talk about within government. Uh, yes, you know, we, we talk within government, but we need to talk also within the public. Because as a society, we're going to collectively make those decisions. And I think this is why it's just so important for everybody to have, to, to understand science. We talk about science literacy. Otherwise, how are you going to make up your mind and, and make the choices? But I, I want to go back, you know, to, to the question, which is a very Im important one. And um, you guys were not born when uh, those kind of questions were being asked about cloning. Uh, so w w when we started doing molecular biology and all the you know the great things that we've been doing with genetics and the human genome and so on, people were very afraid also that we're going to start you know cloning babies and humans and, and everything. And what happened is society, uh, scientists, ethicists, philosophers got together and put boundaries. And this is you know exactly what you were saying. So. I don't think that we should stop uh, developing technology and science because we're afraid what it will do. I think we should keep doing it because at the end of the day, science and technology ought to be at the service of humanity. And it's up to us to put the proper boundaries. It's actually up to you because you're the ones who are going to be deciding. It, it's so true. And yesterday, I think we uh, we learned that two little monkeys were born through, uh, you know, like uh, how do you say that? The, 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 the clonage, I yeah. think. And you know, like it brought the question: uh, it can help the humanity because you know, like uh, we can save life, for example, by cloning some part of a human being. But at the same time, we're afraid that those clones are going to replace us, uh, or you know, like the humanity. And it's a question that needs to be there every day in our mind, as uh, you know, like because we're citizens and are involved in our thinking, and and it's also it, it needs to be in the mind of all those who actually do research, and they have you know like regulation that they have to follow, they have guidelines. You cannot do research you know like. Uh, in it, you know, like you need a framework to actually introduce to a group that actually accept it. So there are stages before when you do research. You can do whatever you want. It's not free for all. Maybe just on a, like a purely technical level, uh, Elon and Stephen Hawkins are in the vast minority with their opinions on this subject. And being uh, in the field, in terms of actually being worried about the singularity, uh, it's, it's not going to happen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Like we have trouble uh, doing very, 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 very basic things. Still. I think there's a lot of fear about technology and what it's going to do. Just as a very simple example, because I have no AI training or anything, but the telephone when it came in in the early 1900s, and you probably don't know landlines were <laughs> actually happening in the house, they're all yes. connected by cell phone. But me growing up, we had a phone that was plugged into the wall. Um, apparently, when the phones first came in, there was this real fear that nobody would go out and socialize anymore. You were all in the state, you're all just going to talk on phones. But what happened was it got people making plans to go out to dinner, to go out and do things. Let's go hiking, let's do whatever. So that fear didn't come to pass. It it's made, yeah, phones. and it's so I don't know about phones today, but. <laughs> it's true that we always think, you know, like I work in communication, 
and it's the same thing. You know, like when radio, you know, like uh, was uh, you know like brought uh, to to you know like uh, to commercial to be commercialized. People thought it was the end of the newspaper. Then TV arrived. It was the end of radio. And you know, like with the internet, we thought it was the end of all the, the type of media. But everything actually comes together quite nicely after a while. Is there other question? I'm sure you have. Just at the end there. Oh, there, there are two questions. One there and one there. The girls are gonna ask yes, yes, they're there. Today. You know, like uh, they're coming. Good. One there and the other uh, after that is uh, at the end there. The red shirt. Yeah. Um, okay. I just had to introduce yourself. If you can, just tell us your name. My name is Ali. Uh, I was just wondering, I don't know who stated it, but um, you said something about phytoplankton being the main source of oxygen in oceans. Yep. And I was just wondering also, and I, I don't know that. Uh, Rose, uh, phytoplankton is plant plankton, so it, it is the major plant in the ocean, and via photosynthesis, it produces oxygen, and that uh, produces the air that we breathe. Scientists certainly say that they produce at least 50% of the oxygen we breathe with trees, plants on land producing the rest. But there are even uh, scientists have calculated it might be as much as 85% of the oxygen we breathe. So phytoplankton is critically important. And there was another question at the oh, end here. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> just introduce yourself. Go ahead. And Amy. Um, I just. Uh, I hear a lot that there's not that many uh, women in the STEM uh, jobs, and I want to know um, what are some of the most difficult things when you are uh, a woman in the STEM? Their career path, like yes. through education, through their and their work. Yeah. What is the main roadblock you actually uh, found on your on your path? Oh, yeah. Jamie. Yeah, sure. So when I went to engineering, we were very few females in my engineering class. I think I'm, uh, we were definitely less than a third. And depending on the engineering as well, there's less uh, less girls in certain engineering than versus others. And in electrical engineering, there it wasn't too too bad, but it was still very very small. And I think the, there's a misconception in terms of what you do after you finish your engineering degree. And a lot of people tend to think of, as I mentioned earlier, the hardware and the, the building stuff. And I find that if you look at females too, we tend to look, want to look more, we want to look farther. So if you look at health professionals, and now it's becoming more and more female and majority female, because we see the impact and we want to help people. Well, we need to also teach the young females that engineering and other science degrees, it's not just about what you're doing, but it's about the final impact. And I find one of the challenges is when you're young is to get that message out to girls um, and to encourage girls to do this. But when you're encouraging them, get them to see the bigger picture and what the impact is. Uh, and then another, um, I guess, challenge when you're when you're in your engineering degree is not to not to f try to fit into that mold that others are trying are expecting you to fit into. So if you're wearing the title of an engineer, some people think you were supposed to be like this, and yet uh, the, some of the best engineering teams are made up of a mixture of men and women, and many diverse backgrounds because you bring so much different perspective and different views to the table, and you don't have to come up with the same ideas as your male colleague, uh, you come up with your own ideas and it comes from a different angle and guess what it makes your final pro product that much better so if we work together in diverse teams um, it, it makes something better so try not to let yourself be forced into that mold and to bring your yourself and bring, bring your own background and your own uh, knowledge to the table and your own strengths A diverse group make better decision making, for sure, in any type of field. Arnaud, tu veux y ajouter? Ah oui, moi quand j'étais en mathématiques appliquées, c'était très très ennuyant en fait. C'était pas très. Mais et c'est vrai jusqu'à récemment, je vois un changement. En fait, je reçois de plus en plus maintenant de CV de candidates. C'est une bonne chose, et j'ai de plus en plus de collègues. Mais c'est assez récent. Donc, 
j'ai l'impression qu'il y a une tendance quand même au changement. Ce qui est bien. Mais moins ambiant. <rire> Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres roadblocks que, dont vous aimeriez parler qui pourraient peut-être apaiser les esprits de, de nos participants aujourd'hui? Rosemary? Teachers serious and that you wanted to do this. And you know, I made plenty of failures, but I also, you know, pulled up my socks and went back and I did it again because I really don't like <laughs> being stymied by something. And I used to say, make friends with math or chemistry, get familiar with the equations. That's what I certainly did in statistics. I, I was abysmal with statistics. And now I find it, it's the coolest thing, especially and the hook is do something with it. Um, when you do a research project, and it's like, okay, I've got my data, especially you take ownership of it. You, I went out there, I collected data on those whales, and I want to see, uh, do I have significant results? So I apply some statistical test to it, and you get help, you know, work with your colleagues, say, hey, is this the one to use? Get support from one another, and certainly as a female, we do that a lot. And uh, anyway, I like statistics now, so there you go. Is there one last question? No, two, three, three. Okay, we have to make it quick. Okay, just one there, one there, and one there, and that would be it. Yeah, just go ahead. Hello, Introduce I'm Amit. I'm Amit. Uh, what type of analytical skills slash background do you have to be uh, in order to fully learn uh, programming language like C Sharp or JavaScript, or some type of framework uh, in order to somewhat succeed and thrive in the industry? Eli, maybe for you. Uh, You're the programmer. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, I mean, like, uh, growing up, uh, for, I mean, for some reason I was always confused why they, they, people always said, like, oh, you know, like, if you're good at math, you're going to become a programmer. Uh, because, you know, I became a programmer, and while I personally will use a lot of math at times, I was like, you know, like, when I code, I don't always just, like, yeah, sure, I add up things, but everyone can add up. But I think really what's important is that um, it's, well, it's like going from one language to another, different framework, all these like, different things. You always go into them and like you don't really know anything about it. But at the basic of it, what ends up happening is always like sort of a basic understanding of how things work and sort of like structuring your ideas and, and kind of understanding how do you want different things to work together. And that's a really interesting part of it. So I I never liked when someone just gave me a formula and was like, oh, here, just memorize it. I, I was like, no, like I can't memorize, I'm horrible at memorizing things. Like if I don't understand why, it's never gonna stick in my mind. So for me what worked was like the more I wanted to learn like, oh, how does a computer work? And that's one thing that like for example, we all use computers. Like I grew up with a computer, I'm the youngest here by far. Yes, you are. I grew up with a computer. Oh by far, he said. <laughs> Be careful. I grew up with a computer. <laughs> I grew up I grew up in a time I grew up like when I was, when I was in my house, there was never a house without a computer. No, that's and, but like even now today, like we all use computers, but like the future is now, like computers are here, technology is here, like a lot of people like, like someone else was saying like, oh my kids, like they'll use computers, they're using like no one understands how it works, and I think like, oh you know, we learn a lot about like these things, you know, like we learn about math, we learn about biology, we learn about all these things, because yeah, we need to know how the body works, right, because we're all human, but like, we all, you computers are so important today, and I think it's really important for us to start actually knowing a bit more about how they work because they impact us so much and like you we were saying earlier about like this whole AI thing, yeah. everything like it's part of our life it's not going anywhere no, it's not going and anywhere. and it's not going to be some like machine <coughs> machine learning scientist who's going to be deciding everything it should be everyone having a basis of knowing about stuff so that you can make decisions like being informed not just being like oh no uh, AI is coming it's going to steal my job you know interesting here. Um, hi, my name is Georgia. I was wondering, do you think that self-driving cars will work in the country? Because we have lots of little roads that aren't very well. Self-driving car. Yeah, self-driving. Exactly. I think we have this for you. Uh, I mean, they'll at some point, but <laughs> not anytime soon. Point. So, like, I, I mean. Really don't believe the hype about self-driving cars. I think uh, the day that you can, the day that you can buy a car that doesn't have a steering wheel or a brake pedal, uh, 
it's a long way off. What, what you will see soon, I think, is mobility on demand services in urban areas that you can pay a service and use that don't have a driver. Uh, but yeah, some of the work that we've been doing, like actually the video that I showed, was actually trying to tackle the problem of doing rural environments. And because those maps get just so big, you really you, you really have to get away from this mapping idea, um, which is yeah, which is still being pursued kind of primarily in academia, but uh, uh, not so much in industry. Thank you. One last question. Here, uh, I think it's already done. It's here. Yes. Hi. Um, so I know that computers are really advanced, but at what point will they learn by themselves like the human brain? Mm -hmm. For example, Siri, it's all predefined, I think, but when, at what point, will it work as a network and learn by the people, like, thinking, actually, it's all Yeah, so an ordinateur will think by himself, at what point, and at what point, it will learn by itself. That's already happening. Uh, and lots, lots and lots of applications. So, I mean, it's nothing too scary. So, like, it is. It's not. <laughs> so, so the, the way that a lot of these systems are built are just, uh, they're built in a way that to, to, to like model the brain in some sense, although they're a pretty poor model. Uh, but they're just an interconnection of uh, neurons. And then if we have a bunch of data that we know the, 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 like, uh, the, value, the correct value, then we can just train this network to, to, to predict uh, new values when we give it new pieces of input. And so this thing can be learning over time as, uh, as it goes, based on whether you tell it, you know, that it got it right, then it knows it has a, a positive data point, or if you tell it that you got it wrong, then it has a negative data point. And so all of these, uh, particularly for sure, Siri uh, is using uh, machine learning, which is some kind of like model of the, of the human brain, to, uh, to translate your voice into text, for example. Thank you so much. Angelina, Ian Paul, um, César Correa, Rosemary Seaton, Dr. Mona Neymar, uh, Eli, I've got a problem with your last name, I'm so sorry, Alpine Afush, and uh, Jamie Simini. Thank you so much. <laughs>